It was a humbling honor for Pastor Clopton to invite me up here, take a chance on a crazy boy like me, to come and share what thus saith the Lord. Amen. There is also, it's a treat. This must be a trusting place. Pastor said I'm a military man. In the military, when someone asks you to volunteer, that's the last thing you're going to do. Because, you know, you say you like to play uh, baseball, you'll be out in the baseball field picking up rocks. Doing, and so you got a trusting, loving congregation <laughs> willing to go. Come on. Amen. Amen. And so what I want to do is first thank my family and loved ones who've come out to be with me this morning. Would you please stand? I, I, we got some people being shy over here. Thank you so much. Thank you for praying with me, being with me, and ushering me through so many things. God bless you. Amen. On this Father's Day, I have the honor to have my son and daughter here. Amen. Amen. Now, that's, that's God's gift to me. I didn't even know my son was going to be in town. And so, in fact, he's a Howard grad. Okay. You know. Now, between them, my daughter is a Hampton grad, so, you know, there's a little bit of stuff there. And then in the family, we have a Northwestern grad, a DePaul grad. Thank God for our young folks really moving forward. Amen. 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 So let us pray. Most gracious, all wise, all knowing God, you have brought us to this divine appointment. Have your way. Speak your truth. Open our hearts and our souls to hear what thus saith the Lord. Lord, don't just let us hear it, but help us to internalize it. Help us to walk with it and help us to apply it, even if it's tough. Help us to know that you're with us every step of the way. And we'll be so careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, let every child of God say, Amen. Amen. So those of you with your Bible, would you turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. The Gospel of John, chapter 11. And we're going to start with verse 38. That's the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 38. When you have it, please say amen. amen. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. Okay. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. For he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou hearest me always, but because the people would stand by, I said it, that they might believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with the napkin. Jesus said unto him, Loose him and let him go. This is the word of the Lord. 
for our sermon today. I'd like for us for the next few moments to think on this theme, come out your grave. Okay. All right. Come out your grave. Now, before we get to the text that we just read, there's some things that happen. If you go to the first chapter of that 11th, uh, first verse of that 11th chapter, we find that a messenger comes and tells Jesus that Lazarus, his dear friend Lazarus, is sick. Now, what do we usually do when we hear that someone is sick? We had a situation just the other day. We heard my uncle, my mother's brother, was in the hospital. What did we do? We went to go see him. A lot of times when we hear someone sick, we stop what we're doing, don't we? But it seems like Jesus' theme song right now is, don't nobody bring me no bad news. Because he gets this message, and what does he do? He stays put for two whole days. Now, if you get into some of the theology here, you'll find that there's a lot of scriptures put in there where the biblical writers, the storytellers, wanted to help us understand that Jesus did love Lazarus. And so we see that, that verse 5 in there that lets us know Jesus loved Lazarus, but verse 4 and 6, Jesus is like, all right, he's sick, and disciples keep doing it. We're staying right here. Okay. Don't nobody bring me no bad news. Jesus said that this sickness was not to death. But then we find that Jesus still for two days, did not do anything different at all. Don't nobody bring me no bad news. But there's a message here. Because as this message is coming out, telling Jesus this, that, that Lazarus is sick, this sickness is grave, this sickness could be unto death, Martha and Mary don't know what Jesus is thinking. They're over there grieving a brother who's sick. They're watching a brother who's withering away. They're watching their loved one, a sickness, take over their body, a life just dialing out. And Jesus, with his disciples, he's telling them, God is doing something here. He's telling them, God has a purpose here. But do you think Martha and Mary hear that? If you look at some, some of the commentary, it'll say they're about 20 miles away. No cell phone, no Western Union, no, I, I, I guess they rode a camel, might have taken a while. But Martha and Mary didn't have the benefit of this message that the disciples heard Jesus saying. Has that ever happened to you? Right when you're facing a terrible situation, right when you're afraid, the very thing that you fear the most, is that what Job said? The thing I fear the most has come upon me. Since this thing has come upon you, you reach out to God, you send an SOS, you send that emergency call, but what do you hear? Crickets. Nothing. You hear the sounds of life around you, but you want to hear God. Amen. You're looking around, God, where are you? You're wondering, why am I going through this? Just tell me something, anything. Tell me to get lost, God. How do I deal with this? Martha and Mary are watching their brother wither away. And they know Jesus, if he just got the message, would be there. This is the same Jesus who's, who's um, freeing up people. He's healing folks. He's giving sight to the blind. He's making the lame walk. This Jesus, they've seen this Jesus in operation. They have a special relationship with this Jesus, but yet this Jesus isn't there. This is where Martha and Mary are. This is where we find ourselves a whole lot of time. 
And it's against this backdrop that I want us to look at a few things that the scripture is trying to tell us. Is that all right? One of the things the scripture is trying to tell us is that we need to know what a grave is. All right? We need to know what a grave is. Another thing the scripture is trying to tell us is that we need to understand how to deal with grave diggers. Amen. Amen. We need to understand how to deal with grave diggers. And then the third thing the scripture is trying to tell us is we need to be ready for our name to be called. Okay, all right. All right? That's it. The first thing, we need to know what a grave is. We need to know how to deal with grave diggers. And we need to be ready for our name to be called. All right. Now, in the scripture, we see that it tells us there in verse 38 that a grave is a cave with a stone rolled over it. <laughs> Did y'all hear that? Yes. A grave is a cave with a stone rolled over it. Rolled over. Now, somebody's not getting that. I'm going to say it one more time. A grave is a cave with a stone rolled over it. You say, well, preacher, what does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> you see, first, we know that there's a cave. Amen? Amen. We know, amen? Amen. Yeah, help me out now. Amen. Now, then we know there's a stone involved. Amen. Right? And so, let's look at cave. What are caves? For millennia, Caves are places where people have hidden. Caves are places where people have made their home. Okay. Caves are places where people come together, get out of the storm. Caves are places where people have even come to find food and water. Caves. I will submit to you that we all, every day, are in some type of cave. Okay. Now we call them our home. We call them family. We call them our place of work. We call them our hobbies. We call them our experiences. They're caves, they're just life. Things that we just do in life, places where we meet people, places where we go, where we do meaning making, meaning we do things that bring value to life, caves. That's a cave, but it ain't a grave yet, right? And I said we're gonna talk about what is a grave. So now that we know what a cave is, we know that a, a grave is a cave with what? A dead person in it. Now, the, the pastor said with a dead person in it. Well, that, that comes up. But we know that a grave is a cave with a stone rolled over it. So let's look at what a stone is. Because this is where it starts getting a little messy. Stone. If you talk to a geologist, they're going to tell you that stones are rocks that have human intervention. A stone is a rock that has human intervention. So when we like these nice, pretty countertops and masonry, someone had to chisel that out of some rock. All right? So now, at this point, we know that someone laid a stone over this cave that Lazarus is in, right? Yeah. But we need to go a little further to understand this stone. Because if a stone is a rock with human intervention, then you might say, well, what is a rock, preacher? <laughs> yes, what is a rock? Well, let's go back to our geologists again. There are three types of rock. There's one type of rock that is basically comes out of lava and magma. You know, you hear about the volcano in Hawaii. Yeah. There's one type of rock that just comes out of that. It just flows and it hardens. And then it becomes that hard rock. There's another kind of rock that's called sedimentary. That's when there's a flow. Have you ever just seen things flowing down a mountaintop? And it flows to a point where it gets stuck and gets hard. 
and then it just sits there. Then there's a third type of rock that's called metamorphosis, meaning it's changing. So that means that rock comes from heat, movement that's getting stuck, or pressure. That's what rock is. Heat, movement that gets stuck, or pressure. That's a rock. Now remember we said a grave is a cave with that stone, right, rolled over. And we know the stone has to be come out of one of those kind of rocks that someone had to chisel up and use. Okay. So right now, what we can do is look at our life and start seeing how the rocks form in our life and how they can become stones. Can you see it yet? Okay, okay. You're married. you married couples, married folk. One of you likes to roll the toothpaste up from the bottom. Another one likes to squeeze it from the middle. That is a rock. And if you keep on doing it, you're going to get angry. Next thing you know, you're moving the toothpaste. You're hiding it. You're doing this and that. Stones in our life. Come on now. Now, I spent a lot of years in full-time ministry. And one of the things that we used to have to watch out for. You know somebody, sister, brother, I'm not gonna pick, I'm, be careful saying the name, because I don't know everybody's name here. They got their favorite seat. Yes. Come on. Come on. Got the favorite seat. Now, you would think we're talking about death. I'm trying to tell you how you get, go from a cave to a grave. Because you can see, these rocks form over time, right? They got their favorite seat. What do they do when someone is sitting in their seat? Lord have mercy, we need to go ahead and have an exorcism. You would swear the devil came in himself. Just mad. Stones in our life. Let's not talk about road rage. Oh, let's not talk about all the other things. And then there are those we'll call legitimate issues. Racism, sexism, other violations that come up, that just grow, and when we hold on to the anger, when we hold on to the resentment, it's like that rock forming, and then you know what, we'll get creative with it, won't we? We'll, we'll rationalize it. Human intervention. Chilling that thing out to where now there's a stone that can be laid over your cave to turn it into a grave. A whole bunch of us right now are in graves because we've allowed stones to be shaped out of the rocks that are built in our life. We've allowed stones to be shaped out of our unwillingness to reach out to God. We've allowed stones to be shaped out of those things we struggle with but are afraid to ask for help. Too embarrassed. And just like Mary and Martha, we're in there asking for God to help us. But God would have to tell us to let it go. Because the stone that's covering our cave oftentimes is ours. But when we look further in the scripture, there's something, a little, another twist. You ready for another twist? Okay. There's another little twist. The plot thickens. Did Lazarus get in that cave by himself? No. Did Lazarus roll that stone over the cave by himself? No. So that means there's some other people messing in the soup. <laughs> there's, some, there's a cook in the kitchen that can't cook. <laughs> but you are expected to eat it. There's some stuff going on that may be beyond you, but yet fully about you. And this is where we talk about the grave diggers. Hmm. Grave diggers. There are people who have the noble profession of working in cemeteries, working with what the rituals we have for our loved ones after they've transitioned. That's not the people I'm talking about right now. Tell us who you're talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about grave diggers. Now, now to, to, to bring this out, can I, can I go someplace for a second? Can, can I? 
let me talk about a gold digger. Okay. Right. okay is, is, we all right? Yeah. I don't want to shake anybody up too much now. No, go ahead. Go ahead. So we heard about a gold digger. <laughs> Am I enunciating okay? Yeah. Well, you want to make sure those words come out clear. A gold digger is someone who's seeking fortune, fame, in exchange for favors. Mm. Amen? That, did I clean it up all right? Now, now, at this point, I don't advise you to look at anybody. Uh, at, at this point, I just think you just need to sit and listen to what God might be saying to you. Because a, this is a gold digger. Now, I'm not calling anybody a gold digger, but I'm about to move to a grave digger. A grave digger is someone who just stirs up mess. Now, don't, don't, I, told, I asked you. Don't blame it on me. Don't look at anybody right now. Just, just talk to God. A grave digger is someone, when you talk with them, invariably the conversation is going to turn negative. Because remember, we talked about what a rock is and how it turns into a stone, right? When mess builds up. A grave digger is someone that's toxic. No matter what it is, there's going to be something in there wrong. All the time. We even have it uh, in the church. Uh, now, yeah, I, I used to be responsible for cleaning that stuff up. And let me tell on myself, there were times if I wasn't careful, guess what? I got my grave digger badge too. You see? Because the ideal is that it's easy to fall into grave digging. It's easy to see the mess. Now some of you have been dealing with mess for so long that that's what you know. But that's why we got Jesus. And so what we need to understand is how do we deal with that grave digger? Because like we said, Lazarus didn't put himself in there. Now Lazarus got sick, we don't know. We know that we brothers on, on Father's Day, we tend not to go to the doctor. But they didn't tell us anything about how Lazarus got sick. We don't know, in fact, at this point, Lazarus is a passive backdrop to this story. Okay. Lazarus seems to be the one whom the story is all happening to while everybody else is trying to figure it out. But these grave diggers were right there in the text. Okay. Did you see them in there? <laughs> Can I point them out to you? Yeah, go ahead, point them out. When Jesus decided to come to where Lazarus was, and when he got there, it says that Jesus was troubled. Now, if you look up the Greek word that's used right there, that word trouble means to disturb and shake that, that which should be solid. It means to turn up that which should be grounded. So Jesus comes in to do what God would want him to do, but yet he was troubled by what was going on. If you look at the text, he gets troubled when he's interacting with Mary and Martha. But I can give them a pass. That's their brother. They are so blinded by grief. What, what, come, now, come on. Can, can we just be real? The Reverend Dr. James Miles, me, there were times in my ministry journeys when I would tell you, I don't hear you pray for me. <laughs> Talk about some rocks. There were times when I didn't want to hear you read a scripture. And the best thing you could do was smile and keep stepping. Now, because of the positions I held, at times, I could kind of, you know, block it off, you know, have the gatekeepers. But you can't do a gatekeeper with God. And no matter how much you try, God is going to get through. The grave diggers in the text are those people who are around well-meaning folk. Because they came to comfort Mary and Martha. But when they see Jesus and they see how he cried, you know that shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. wept. Yeah. 
Come on, y'all. You know when you're in a prayer circle and they want everybody to quote a scripture? And you're hoping nobody gets to that scripture before you? So when it's your turn to quote a scripture, you just say, Jesus wept. Amen. It's in there. It's in there. Well, that happens right here in this text. Jesus wept. And if you look into that, it wasn't just a little tear. It was he had an emotional reaction to this experience. And so the folks around, they say he really did love Lazarus because they saw how he reacted. But what else did they do? This is where the grave diggers come in. They also said, well, he, if he could heal these folks, he sure enough could have done this. What's wrong? Grave diggers. This is the almighty God in the flesh going to let the one whom he loves die? What's up with that? Grave diggers. But here, Jesus and Martha show us how to deal with it. Because Martha comes up and Jesus says, Jesus tell him, take me where Lazarus is. And what happens next in the text shows us even how easy it is to get caught up in grave digger stuff. We call it grave digger ology. Can I call it that right now? We just make that up here in Cosmopolitan. Because they know that in the Jewish custom, if a body was dead for four days, the spirit was gone. That's in their custom. In the Jewish custom, when a righteous man dies, it was a loss to the family, not a celebration. And so in this moment, Martha had probably just resigned herself to a life without her brother. Now let's go a little deeper into the story, can we? They, biblical scholars think that Lazarus was in the scene, a particular group of Jews. And one of the things that they knew about Lazarus, Mary, and Martha was that they were out in the community. They were out helping the sick, feeding the poor, so they were known, so all these people gather. But come on, church folk. We know that just because we all gather don't mean we all on someone accord. Yes. Amen. And so Martha in her grief, Martha in this moment where she's just finding, okay, my brother is gone. He didn't come. She didn't go off on Jesus. She just like Jesus, he's dead. You don't want to mess with this. He's dead. He's gone. And she's hearing all this stuff because she's taking in all the culture. She's taking in all the superstition. She's taking in all the talk around her. Grave diggerology. You got it? Right now, in this time, for folks of color, can I just say black folk? If there was ever a time when we better be listening to God and moving past some of our superstition, Getting past those parts of the culture that hold us back, it's right now. Because these people are acting a fool. Yeah. Amen? Amen? If there was ever a time when we need to really stand up and get clear about who we are as black folk, yeah. black folk who love Jesus, yeah. it's right now. Yeah. We don't have time for the superstition. We don't have time for these cultural blocks right. to hold us back. Right. And so, hey, nobody's going to fault you for having a moment. Who can't? I would say that something's wrong with you if you don't. Okay. Right? That means you're in some kind of denial. Yeah. But the idea is looking at Martha and Jesus. When Martha says this to Jesus, Jesus challenged Martha, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He said, didn't I tell you that this was for the glory of God? Didn't I tell you that Lazarus is going to be raised from the dead? Didn't I tell you? Now what Martha does next, she says yes. She didn't argue. She didn't debate. Now, we don't know what she felt, but we know what she did. She said, okay, Jesus. And then she stepped back. And so the grave diggers don't have a right to you. Okay. The grave diggerology wow. does not have the script on you. Wow. But we've got to declare who we are. Amen. Otherwise, the grave digger stuff would take over. So, then we move 
to this next and final piece. Be ready for your name to be called. <laughs> be ready for your name. Because at this point in the story, at this very moment, Lazarus is still up in that grave. All this stuff is going on. And this is like high, high drama. You know what I mean by that? High drama. Lazarus is in the grave. The people are standing around. You know, some of them just waiting to see what's going to happen. And there's probably some bookie who took bets. Do you know? Come on, that's how we do. There's somebody in there. Martha, you know, she's now kind of, okay, okay, I believe, I believe. Not just in the end times, I believe right now. And so Jesus steps up and he says, roll the stone away. Now, a stone is a rock that's been carved. A stone is all that mess you hold on to. Jesus comes up and says, roll the stone away. Now, Lazarus can't roll that stone away. In fact, Lazarus is still in the backdrop, isn't he? So what we understand here is that you got to be around people who you know are going to do right. You can't have company of grave diggers. If all you know are grave diggers, they'll party with you. Yeah, amen. But when your money's gone, I'm going to tell you, I got, I, I got a couple of grave diggers, and I like them. I like them, you know. And if I'm in town, I'll go see them. But I know I can only handle so much. Because next thing you know, I'll be starting like, okay, okay, I got to get away from you. Love you, but I got to get. And this one brother said to me, you know, James, every time I think you're out, down and out, you come right back. I was like, well, what do you expect? You know, I got a little offended. He was trying to compliment me. But you know those backhanded compliments? You know, throwing shade, as Pastor just said. Where they kind of giving you a compliment but talking about your mess. You know, that, that grave digger stuff. So we got to know who's in our company. And it can't just be full of grave diggers. Because I bet you the grave diggers didn't move that stone. Mm -hmm. They were probably busy talking. Wow. <laughs> and so when Jesus came in, because now, do you remember high drama? Right now, this is the time. This is like the curtain's about to open. The main, everything else built up to this one act. Will Lazarus come forth or not? Wow. Now, Pastor told you I'm a military man. In my background, and even in ministry sometimes, I've had experiences where I can step up into a space, say two words, and see a hundred folks step off. Just by, and step off what I mean, fanfare and regiment and just sharp. Don't we do it in church sometimes? Yes. You know, right now Jesus is about to do that. What Jesus does is that he steps up after they roll that stone away, and then he comes forward, and Keith, I would imagine that he stands there and says, like, like a good Marine would stand at attention, and said, Lazarus, come forth. They say that the cave probably has some depth to it. Wow. And that Lazarus, he wanted to make sure his voice projected. But we also heard in the prayer what Jesus said, he wanted to make sure everybody heard. Right. He said, this isn't for me, God. This is for these knuckleheads. Mm -hmm. They need to know that you're still God. Yeah. They need to know. Yeah. Even the grave diggers yeah. might get saved today. Yeah. Come on. We need to comfort Martha and Mary. We need to really shore up the faith of those who are trying to exercise it. And then the mother ones. They might come along, but right now, Jesus called Lazarus forward. And then what does the scripture say? Lazarus came forward. But is it over with? No. Lazarus came forward, and it said he came forward bound. His body was bound and a napkin in some text over his face. So Lazarus came forward, his body and mind tied up. 
And so what did Jesus say next? He told the community, because remember, Lazarus can't do it. He told the community, remember, we got to watch out who we have around us. He told the community to go and loose him. Let them grave clothes go. Who cares whether the toothpaste is rolled up from the bottom or the middle? Yeah, I mean, I get irritated sometimes. I, I'm, I'm one of them from the bottom people. You know, all you middle people got a problem. But amen, I can get over it sometimes. You know, I just kind of go and squeeze it back up. Amen. But he, Lazarus, he told him to let those grave clothes go. And what we have right now on this Father's Day is a call for our brothers to step up. It's a call for us to understand that we've got to get ready. You see, one thing that we know, I learned it in the military. Some people learn it in sports. You learn all kinds of things. The moment when I stepped up and gave that command, that wasn't a moment for everybody to learn what to do. Are you hearing this? The moment when church service starts, that ain't the moment to try to figure out how we're going to praise Jesus. I'm just saying. In that moment, come out there, and when you speak that, there's a sense of knowing. I submit to you that Lazarus is not passive in the text. So Lazarus, before he died, must have lived a life so that he could recognize his name when it's called. Lazarus, before he was laid in the grave, must have had the seeds of God in him so that if God chose to call his name, he would hear it no matter how deep the cave. Wow. Lazarus was ready when his name was called. What are you doing to get ready? We already said today is the time. My brothers, what are you doing to make sure you're ready when your name is called? It ain't because we know there's a need. Our families need it. Our communities need it. Our society needs it. What are you doing to be ready when your name is called? Because you might find yourself in the cave, but God will call you out. And then the community around you will take those clothes off, and then they say, let them go. My brother, I'm telling you, when you take a step, you got to step and let them go. My brothers, I'm telling you, when you step out that cave, when God calls you, you got to step and let it go. Because what Jesus is saying to us right now is that this is the time when there's no grave can hold you back. This is the time he doesn't care what the stone is made out of. There is no stone too great for God to call you out. But when he calls you out, you still may be bound because that stuff is still there. Lazarus still had the struggle of what he went through. But when they let him go, the next instruction is for you can let him, to let him go do what he's supposed to do because Lazarus had a calling. Okay. Brothers, you got a calling. Yeah. Brothers, God is telling us right now to step into our calling. Yeah. Brothers, right now there's young men and young women who need each of us to do what we've been put here to do. And so right now on this Father's Day, I commit to you, come out of your grave. Wow. Do what God's called you to do and let God get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.